we're very fortunate that we're living in an epic moment in history where we can see the prophets come alive, where we can not only hear the sounds of the instruments, but we can now hear the harmony of this great symphony that the greatest men and women, women the Nevi'im of Klai Yisrael, convey to us these holy oracles. Begin by thanking Johnny and Ellie Sheva for opening your home so that we could engage in the study of Tanakh. And this series is on Yeshayahu, literally means the salvation of HaKadosh Baruch Hu of God. One of the things I share with you in the past is, I remember when in, I was in yeshiva, I thought there were some students who, who I thought were really much smarter than me. But sometimes people come to the book of Isaiah and they kind of go through the first chapter and then they, they go through half of chapter two and they basically shut the book. It's not easy to understand. Isaiah of 66 chapters, only about five or six of them are written in the way that Joshua is written, or Judges is written, using standard prose, using some semblance of a standard chronology. There's almost nothing in this book that resembles that. It's all a song. And what we do together is unravel that music. I remember years ago, I was lecturing in Philadelphia. And I, I, I don't, was it, a, I think it was at Penn, I'm not sure. But whoever hosted me to speak at the university asked me, do you want to come to the concert of the Philadelphia Orchestra, whatever, symphony orchestra, whatever it is. And I'm not into, I'm not a fancy guy. I'm not, a, I'm not, I don't have this fancy taste and brie and fine, I don't, but it was free of charge. The Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra, I don't even know if I'm saying it correctly, but it's certainly, if I ever heard of it, that must be, must be unbelievable that a person like me would ever hear something like that. It means how many orchestras do I know out in the world? How many, sim I don't know. As it turns out, this guy apparently is a very important person, and he had not just any seats, but he had premium seats that he got to come in to, to watch the symphony before anyone else showed up. And seats, Mamish, right in the front. It was a huge, whatever, room, auditorium. So here I were, like, I don't know, him with his wife, maybe some other fancy fellow, and I'm sitting there, and all the musicians are, they're, the place is empty, so they're practicing, they're tuning up, and each one is doing something completely different. The violinists are doing, it just sounds like a cacophony of noise. The trumpet players would whatever trumpet players do, and the, the, the piano player, she's flying up, and now she's brilliant, really brilliant, but it just sounds like noise. The violinist, each one in the room, because no one was there except for like five or six people, the whole place, thousands of people, empty. So they were all practicing, tuning up whatever it is they do, and I was listening, I was like, this just sounds like a lot of noise, because they were all tuning up. No, it came time, for the doors to open. So all the musicians left the stage, the lights went on, and then people were allowed in. And then once the audience was sat down and they were properly introduced, all those same musicians, the all world-class musicians, came in and they applauded, and then the soloist violinist came in and they applauded, and this woman who's pianist, some world-renowned pianist, who's playing music of a guy, I know I can't even pronounce his name, she comes in, everyone bows, and then the, they started playing the music. But instead of it being noise and a cacophony of sounds that seemed, to, suddenly I understood, ah, I remember that the music of the trumpet that I heard, 
now I see how that fits perfectly into the music that was in the piano. And now the harpist who's there, who before I didn't know what the heck she was doing, now I see it feels in gorgeous. And look at this piece of thing. And that's what it all is. This astounding harmonies that are just exploding. These numinous sounds were bring. I just couldn't even believe what I was hearing. And that's the nature of music. And that's why music is so important in Tanakh. Because, you know, if you play a, a note like C in different octaves, but it's the same note, it isn't really very interesting at all, right? But if you play a C, an E, and a G, just three different notes, you now have a transcendent sound of the C major. Different sounds coming together, producing something that's much greater than any of those individual sounds. And that's what's happening in Isaiah. It's really music. But if chas v'chalil, if heaven bid, someone comes and just looks at one instrument, doesn't understand how it fits into all the instruments in Tanakh, the person will think, I'm just watching a bunch of people with fancy outfits who are playing sounds that don't fit together. And I'd like you to join me tonight. To join me not for a, an instrument sound check, but for the concert itself. This is a very special concert. We know that a hundred kilometers from where we are right now, a little more than 60 miles away, we know that more than a hundred Jews are being held hostage. Some of them are in tunnels, Hashem Yirachim. Some of them are in a home. They're all terrified. They cannot be here with us tonight. They're very close. You could drive to Gaza. I went to a wedding a couple of weeks ago. I didn't, you know, GPS, whatever. When I was getting there, I said, oh, look, Gaza's right here. And the wedding is, the wedding hall was mamish, just I could walk there. Our hearts are with them. Our thoughts are with them. My sense is they don't have a book of Isaiah in front of them right now. Our hearts are with the families who are so deeply shattered by this. A nation, a people together are living through one of the most difficult periods in Jewish history. In order to find an event that's even remotely resembling anything what happened, we would have to go back to the Shoah. Kristallnacht 92 Jews were murdered. That launched the Holocaust. The Kishnev pogroms that lasted for two days in 1903 in the Russian Empire, which had a tectonic effect on Jewish life and Jewish history. Two days, Christians were murdering Jews. Two days straight. From Easter, because they were told that a that a Christian boy who was found dead, his blood was used by the Jews for the masses. A very brilliant, insightful idea. So they went for two days, Orthodox Christians went around just killing Jews. <clears throat> One of the striking features of Isaiah, many of you have joined me for other programs, know this, that Isaiah moves almost in the blink of an eye from um, a churban, a deep criticism of the Jewish people. In fact, that's how Isaiah chapter 1 begins. Isaiah chapter 1 is so intense. The criticism of the Jewish people is, is really unparalleled anywhere in Tanakh. That's the chapter, that's the Haftorah that we read immediately before Tisha B'Av. And Isaiah chapter 1 then explodes and says, let's reason together. If there is social justice, if the weakest members of society are cared for, then God will forgive your sins. Even if they're red as crimson, I'll make them as white as snow. And Jerusalem will only, Zion will only be redeemed through tzedakah and mishpat, to righteous and justice. As you can imagine, a verse like that does not make it into the Christian Bible. 
Because in Christian theology, that's outrageous, that's insane. As you can imagine, nowhere in Paul's 13 letters, which are putatively devoted to telling us how redemption would occur, thought that he should quote this verse that says that Zion will be redeemed not through Calvary, not through a cross, not through blood, not through a lamb, by justice and righteousness. I don't know why. Why do the New Testament think there's no reason for that? We all know why. Isaiah chapter 2 explodes with a messianic passage that even the United Nations had the brains to put it outside their building on First Avenue in Manhattan. Mashiach, the first five passages of Isaiah chapter 2, which includes exactly what the Mashiach will do, he will judge among the nations and he'll give hoichacha rebuke to the peoples of the world, and therefore they're going to do tshuva, and they're going to take their implements of war and turn them into implements of agriculture. These are soaring passages that even the United Nations, and I'm I'm not the biggest fan of the UN. I know there are many people here who can't get over the UN, and you can't get over every day, thank God for that UN. Without the UN, we'd be finished. But, but the UN had the brains to at least put on the Isaiah wall, Isaiah chapter 2. The Christian Bible, for some reason, didn't think it was a good idea to tell us that the role of Mashiach is to be a Rebbe in Klal Yisrael and in the world, to teach the world to do tshuva. And as a result, the nations will put away their implements of war and turn them into implements of agriculture. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn of war anymore. If there's a war right now in Gaza, which is part of Shevet Yehuda, it means Mashiach is not here. If there's a war in the Ukraine right now, that means Mashiach is not here. If there's a war in Yemen right now, that means Mashiach is not here. According to the U.S. State Department, another very important institution, there are currently 27 wars that are raging in the world. You know about three of them. Why does Isaiah go from such extremes? And these passages where Isaiah is telling us how the world will be redeemed, do you think they find themselves in the Christian Bible? Never. The UN had the insight to include Isaiah chapter 2 on a wall in front of the United Nations on 1st Avenue, I believe it's 42nd Street. The United, the, United, the United Nations knew to put it there. Nation will not lift sword against nation. For as Zion will go forth the Torah and the word of God. That they didn't include on the Isaiah in the United Nations. That's too far. That's too much. All right. But the New Testament doesn't include it at all. This is the most... Why does it include it? Because these ideas do not comport at all with the teachings of the New Testament. Last night, I was, you'll see it on YouTube, but I was involved in a conversation between Muslims and Christians on YouTube. It was really quite exciting. And there was a Christian fellow there. And as I shared this with him, he had no idea whatsoever that this has anything to do with Mashiach, that the Mashiach is a Rebbe that gives haychacha, he's the judge among the nations. There's not one mention in Tanakh that he's doing miracles. Not one, never, not one time. Not one instance that the Mashiach will do any miracle whatsoever. Doesn't mean he won't, maybe he will. But as far as the Navi goes, as far as the Word of God goes, not a mention. Those of you who have even a perfunctory knowledge of the Christian Bible will be aware that when you read the Gospels, the Gospels are all stories. From beginning to end, just storytelling. Straight through. All we have is miracle, 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 miracle. Right? Go... You go to Mark, you have the Incipit, you get Miracle, Miracle, the Baptism, Miracle, 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 Miracle. It's like a magic show. There's nothing like that in Tanakh. Nothing at all. Why does Isaiah operate this way? Why does it such extremes? It almost jolts you from such churban to such criticism to such soaring 
messianic passages. Why? So some people think that the reason why Isaiah speaks this way, it's really jolting. It really is shocking. It, it, it's like um, you almost lose your breath when reading Isaiah. It, it, it's just one moment you, and then explosion of joy and comfort. So some people think that it's because of Isaiah's own life. After all, Isaiah, for example, bore witness to the a great churban during his lifetime. During the a period of Chizkiyahu, for which Isaiah was a prophet throughout 29 years, the 10 northern tribes in three waves were carried off. Imagine that. Everything north of Yerushalayim, the Assyrian Empire carried them off in three waves. Moreover, some people think, well, here we are in Shevet Yehuda right now. Maybe they out in Yehuda, this is a good place to be. As it turns out, more than 40 cities were destroyed by the Assyrian Empire. Sanchev destroyed them. All that was left was Yerushalayim. And the nation were here in, in the old city of Yerushalayim. And the Assyrian Empire thought it was a good idea to bring 185,000 soldiers to surround the city. The remnant of the wall that surrounded Yerushalayim is there in the old city to be seen right by the Jewish quarter behind the square. That wall, which is about 20 feet thick, is Assyrian proof. It's so thick, Davka, because to prevent the Assyrian army. And what happened on Pesach? The army was, the Assyrian army was destroyed. They died overnight. So we have a destruction of the 10 northern tribes during Isaiah's life. That's unbelievable. Unbelievable. And then you have the most, the greatest miracle since the Exodus also occurs during his life in the 14th year of Hiskiah's rule. So perhaps because Isaiah lived during a time of such jolting events, the most catastrophic event since the Exodus occurs in Isaiah's lifetime. And the greatest miracle that the entire Assyrian Empire, the army of the Assyrian Empire, there was no empire in human history that ever had, had, could man such an, an army. Paul Johnson, a well-known well historian, assumes that that number is something in the order of about 4 million people in our day. I mean, when the United States had a coalition against Saddam Hussein, 67,000 people participated in that first battle against Iraq. So maybe this is what causes Isaiah to be so extreme. Maybe it's because Isaiah lived and witnessed and advised and criticized the worst king, Davidic king in Jewish history, who was probably Ahaz. I say Ahaz was probably the worst king in Jewish history. Ahaz ruled for 16 years from the age of 20 until he was 36 years old. Ahaz was a very big Russia, a very, very wicked man. And he never did tshuva. He never repented. Moreover, when Ahaz died, he thought he was a genius because he made an arrangement. He created an alliance with a Siri, thought it was, everyone thought he was a genius. He was very wicked. And Ahaz has a son who's Chizkiyahu. Who is Chizkiyahu? We're told explicitly in Tanakh, there was never a king, a Davidic king, as great as Chizkiyahu. First Kings chapter 8, verse 4 and 5. Never was and never will be. And perhaps that is what pushes Isaiah in such a way. And, and bear in mind, incidentally, it's almost, it's not only in the macro, like the first 39 chapters generally are critical, generally, this is so, doesn't really work, but generally speaking, and 40 through 66, generally speaking, is much more comforting. Generally speaking, it is, right? There is tremendous criticism, this tremendous heichacha, burning heichacha in the last chapters of Isaiah. Just this is a very, but in very, in the most general outline possible, you could say Isaiah 1 through 39 is 
is criticism is a and the last from 40 through 66 generally is comfort. You could say that, but it really doesn't work very well, but it's there. In the same way you see in chapter one, it's almost like a cell. You can look at any cell in the body and see the map of the DNA in, in, in the passage, in the verse. But really what we have found out, because we've been together for some time now, going through the book of Isaiah, we've discovered that Isaiah has something else in mind. It's not that he was mentally shattered by what he observed. It wasn't that at all. It wasn't that he saw the greatest churban and the greatest miracle of salvation. That's not what motivated him to write like this, but rather because he wants us to be greater. We, our role, Isaiah tells us in chapter 42, verse 6, is that we are to be a covenant nation and a light to the goyim. Isaiah 49, verse 6. Not only are we supposed to be a light to nations, but we have to bring back all the shifte, Yaakov, all the tribes of Jacob. So, as such, Isaiah is saying, you're here, and we need you to be here. You're in a very bad predicament right now, and we need you to be way up here. Okay? This theme is all over the book of Isaiah, and that's how Isaiah is operating. That's really the harmony that's going on. You're here, and in order for Mashiach to come, you have to do tshuva. In fact, it explicitly says it in Isaiah. It's the only passage in Tanakh which explicitly says the Jews must do tshuva in order for Mashiach to come. This is the real reason, Kindleuch, that we're not allowed to make calculations of when Mashiach comes. Why is there an idea that we shouldn't try to make a calculation of what, which year Mashiach will come? So people think we'll get disappointed if it doesn't happen. People sometimes made mistakes and made such calculations. The, the reason it's a problem I would submit is not because people might get disappointed. The reason is that you're essentially going to war against Isaiah. Isaiah 59 verse 20 says, Uva litzion go, that a redeemer will come, that's a Mashiach, the shavavei feshavi Yaakov, to those in Jacob who do tshuva. I mean, it's the repentance of the Jews, of Jacob, that triggers the coming of the Mashiach. And the moment you put a year on it, what you're doing is that I am going to, I'm battling with Isaiah 59 verse 20. And because we have free will, the only thing is the Almighty, blessed be his holy name, does things um, in order to produce trouble within us. That's Mashiach ben Yosef. That's all the, these are the contractions, the birth pangs of the Messiah. We have to choose it. But Hashem is going, oh, you're doing, this is how you're behaving in Eretz Yisrael? We need to do things to bring Achdus in Kal Yisrael. We completed um, 11 chapters of, of a masa, of a prophecies of burden that are to alert the nations who are our oppressors, to tell them about their destiny. Actually, there is, are some passages that talk about certain Jews at the end of days who will be the greatest enemies of Kal Yisrael. We find the Novi tells us that there will be Jews who will be the greatest enemies of Kal Yisrael, and they will join in partnership with Gog and Magog, with the enemies of Kal Yisrael, and they'll be the most wicked of all. We're told about this in Zechariah 14. We're told about this in Isaiah. Isaiah 23, that's where we left off the last time we were together, ends with an intriguing, weighty prophecy, a prophecy of doom for a nation called Tyre. What is this? Now, this is all over Isaiah. It's all over Jeremiah. It's all over Ezekiel. These are very famous. I mean, the prophets don't let go of this nation. What is this? Who is this? So this is important. So Tyre, Tyre was a, a nation that was Israel's best friend. The relationship that, that this nation had, it's off of Lebanon, they're extremely wealthy, had a n fabulous um, financial success because of 
um, shipping and and helped to build the base amigdash, helped to build the Jewish state. They were very involved in support for the Jewish state. But they ultimately became arrogant. They demanded that the kings of Yehuda make concessions on the land of Israel, and therefore they were completely destroyed. And those of you who have even a perfunctory knowledge of the book of Ezekiel, so there's a very famous chapter in Ezekiel 28 where the prophet rips him and says, you could have been so great. You had such potential to be a great nation. The Christians say it's talking about Satan. It's not. In fact, Ezekiel 28 says, you're a man and you're not an angel. Dafka says it. Why is this so important to Ezekiel? There are chapters, chapters and chapters and chapters on Tyre, all over. Jeremiah, Tyre, it's all over Tanakh. I'm warning you there's a nation that is one that has a great alliance with Israel, deep friendship with the Jewish state, but ultimately its own survival depended on the support of Eretz Israel, and its arrogance brought about its destruction. Its wealth, we're told, the end of Isaiah chapter 23, will one day be inherited by those who are the elders of Kal Yisrael, those who are truly faithful. It is said, widely said, that the Vilna Gon, who was a giant who lived during the 18th century, I mean, he was a contemporary of King George III, famous a contemporary of George Washington, a contemporary of the American Revolution, said that in fact that the United States, which was founded during his life, he lived throughout, through the 18th century, he said that, we are told, would be the last gullahs for the Jewish people. I should begin by sharing with you that these chapters that we're going to explore tonight, and we're going to listen to the music, are called the Apocalypse of Isaiah. And there's good reason for it. Of all the chapters in this holy book, these four chapters contain the greatest revelation and explosive revelation end time prophecies of anything you'll find anywhere in the book of Isaiah, and that's saying a lot. The chapter begins, Hine Hashem Boike Ka'aretz, the Almighty is going to empty out the land. That's, I mean, the, to empty out here is mamish of violent empty out. This is where we get the word for a bottle of water. How do you say the, a bottle of water? Back book. That's where the word comes from. Why, now, a jar of water might not, we wouldn't use that word. There are other words we can use for a, a keli that holds water. But dafka, one that, where it's thrown away, dafka, one where, it's just, what is its purpose? Just to empty out. To empty out the water. After, what do you do with a plastic bottle? Throw it away. That's what, this is where the word comes from. Complete churban. We're told by Isaiah, that in fact, what is going to happen will affect every strata of society. The Kohanim, the people who are not Kohanim, the wealthy, those who lend money, bankers, and those who borrow money. Ordinary people and people who are very high society, there'll be a total Churban in the land of Israel that's coming. Isaiah not only, of course, lived during a time of a great Churban, Remember, I told you about the 14th year of Chizkiyo, when the northern king, but you still had a Churban that's coming in the far future. Isaiah will reach into the far future of Jewish history in these chapters. Isaiah tells us that, that when this occurs, the land of Israel, when the Jews are expelled from the land of Israel, the land will ex immediately respond to this by doing what? shutting down. The land of Israel only responds to the presence of Jewish people. That's why it really was very difficult for other nations who conquered this land, and many did, it was very hard for them to sustain it. They could have armies here, that was very important. Israel was not only important for the obvious reasons, 
But also, Eretz Yisrael is the, the connection between Asia, Europe, and Africa. This is a really important place. This was not just a 26,000 kilometer country. This was an extremely important place in the ancient world for all the reasons that you could imagine. But in order to prevent any other nation from ever identifying their nationality here, the land closes up. And therefore, people, in order to sustain an army here in Eretz Yisrael, it was really a problem. What did you have to do? You had to import food. That was very complicated. And it's very hard to, when Mark Twain visited Eretz Yisrael and wrote about his encounters and what he, what he observed, his words are very striking. He was really perhaps America's greatest writer. He saw nothing but land that was desolate, a land that is truly mournful. He, he traveled all over the land of Israel, and Mamish found nothing. This is a very intriguing thing, because in other parts of the world, if a land is fertile, the land doesn't care who puts a seed in the ground, you notice that the, the threat of what will happen to the Jewish people and how the land will respond is like in no other holy book. Meaning, in other holy books, the threat is heaven and hell. You're going to go to hell if you don't believe what I'm telling you. It's a fantastic threat. Why does it work brilliantly? Because people are terrified of dying. They have no clue what happens on the other side of the grave. We're essentially the only creature on this planet that fairly quickly knows, are aware, that we're going to die. It's so traumatic that most people cannot, although they can plan for their death, they can plan for, they can, they can, prepare, they can do all those things, but to actually contemplate their own death is so traumatic that most people can't even consider it, even for more than 30 seconds. It's just too much. We know it's going to happen, and it's very frightening. Now, if you, wanna, you want people to remain loyal to your religion, what you do is tell them they're going to go to hell. It works very well, because you can't test it. It's unfalsifiable. You know, if you believe it, then you're baptized, you're saved. And if you believe it not, you're damned. People are petrified. It really does work. It's extremely effective. It, the benefit is that it's completely unfalsifiable. The benefit is that there's no way to test it. Tanakh doesn't make such threats. Not because they're ineffective, they're highly effective. But because you can't test it out. What good is it to say what's going to happen after you're dead? What are you going to do? Go to the cemetery, dig up Charlie and say, hey, buddy, what happened? Can't do that. So as a result, it works very well, but Tanakh doesn't do that. The Navi says instead, if you'll turn against me, so the land will start giving forth its fruit. Your women, chas won't have children. You'll go to battle and your enemies will destroy you. Conversely, if you're loyal to me, so even one will chase a thousand people. It really becomes very simple. So this is something we can see with our eyes. That's what the Navi says. The Navi says, test me, see. Because if you really are God and you're inspiring these remarkable men and women in history, the Navim, so you're God. You actually control the weather. You can control if it rains. And if it doesn't rain, well, nothing is going to grow. Eretz Yisrael forces people to be loyal to HaKadosh Baruch Hu because now the rains are done, right? Now Passover is done, is over with, right? And now throughout the summer, it almost, it's just never going to rain. If it ever happens that it rains here in the summer, it's, front, it's headline news, right? That means it really has to rain during the winter, or else it's not like we are Egypt, that serpent that has a, that flow of water that, and I say serpent because the, the serpent was cursed in the sense that everything will be dust. That means you never need God. But in Israel, you always need Hashem because there's no rain, you're finished. So that's the nature, that's what I want to point to here. It is striking, however, that in these chapters, we have, it's one of the few explicit references to Tchiasimesim, to the resurrection of the dead, but it's not a threat. The, there are threats in Tanakh, you know, Leviticus 26, the Romani 20, there are plenty of threats. What I talked about, the land, this is just mentioned that there will be justice at the end of days, and the wicked will not resurrect, and those who are loyal to Hashem will resurrect. It's 
Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19. In fact, Chazal tell us that a person will merit to have a resurrection if they're Isaac and Tyre, they study Torah based on this passage that we're going to explore tonight. It's very important to be involved in the study of Torah. It's very important to support those who are studying Torah. Chias HaMesim is directly connected to the study of Torah, the resurrection of the dead. But it's the context here in Isaiah 26, verse 19, there's only one other passage like this which explicitly references the resurrection of the dead, and that's Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Now, there are other references to the resurrection in Deuteronomy 32, but those are, they're, they're, they're more than inferences, but it's sort of hard to make out exactly what's being said. It's fairly clear, but here just plain. Isaiah tells us that the grave is nothing more than sheikh ne'ofer. What's a sheikh? Someone who rents an apartment. That means it's a, it's a temporary dwelling for those who are loyal and they'll resurrect like the do. The Navi tells us in chapter 24, verse 9, that during the Golos, they will not drink wine and listen to music. Very interesting that there's a halacha that we learn out from this. is is a gzeir abundance, a rabbinic injunction, a... It is forbidden, based on this passage, to, while in Golos, when there's a base Hamigdash, or while you're living in a, in a Shas, that there's, or it's different. But if you're in Golos, you're not allowed to go to a, a concert and drink wine. That's us, sir. You, now, if you're at a restaurant, I know I get a thousand questions on this, so I just want to, sort of tease this out, this is a very famous passage. If you happen to be in a restaurant, and it happens to be you're at Piccolino or whatever, in that Kikar Music or whatever it's called there, right? You just came there because you like the seared tuna, which is really good, okay? And it happens to be some guy just takes out a guitar and he's playing Hey Jew, whatever. Yes, that's what I said, right? You came there to eat a meal. You didn't come there to listen to music. So that's not a problem. You're not, you did not come to a... Con- but if, you, if their mamash is a, a place that people are playing musical instruments and the ikr is you're there to drink wine, that's also to do. Now, as you can imagine, this is an area that we are fairly lenient on. So there are poskim, there are different opinions on this to what do we have? Is it recorded music and not recorded music? Certainly... If the meal is a, a mitzvah, you're into a wedding, a siyam, a bris, those you can, you can drink wine and have all the live music you want. In fact, Ramosha in his tshuvah is asked the question, when a yeshiva makes a banquet to raise money, are they allowed to have live musicians to play? Is it permitted? This is a very controversial question. So his view was that because of the purpose, even though the banquet's a banquet, but the purpose of it is really to raise money for the study of Torah, therefore is permitted. Isaiah 24 ends, we're, we're approaching Mashiach. Because in the Messianic age, as we're taken through the vision of Hurban, which is absolutely devastating, Isaiah although reminds us that not all Jews will be expelled from the land of Israel, he uses a a fabulous metaphor of the person who smacks the olive tree in order to make the olives drop down. When you have olive trees all over Israel, so how did they used to take the olives out of the trees? They would have, they would set up something that would look like an inverted umbrella underneath the tree, and they would have big poles, and they would beat the tree and cause it to vibrate and when the olives are ripened so the olives then fall into this kind of net that would catch it and that's how they would harvest olives that was typical way throughout the ancient world that's what was done is it easy yeah it's fairly easy it's not labors like you people to climb up on ladders it's not that simple but also is it very effective is it very efficient 
Many olives don't fall down using that technique, but it's not Kedai. Isaiah uses that to explain that always throughout Jewish history, there will be olives that will remain on the tree, which means that there will be Jews in Israel. And throughout Jewish history, there's always been Jewish people here in the land of Israel. Isaiah 24 ends by telling us about the end of idolatry. And he uses, he says, the, the moon will be ashamed the sun will be humiliated before the zikne, before the elders who love HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Well, This is a very intriguing passage because what is he referring to? The, you, know, you know very well that in the ancient world, they saw they worshipped the sun, they worshipped the moon, but what does that mean? They didn't think the sun really was the God, but they saw this as a sort of an intermediary between man and God. This is a very important idea of, of henotheism, that there is a great God, uh, this platonic idea that there is one great God, hence the word henotheism. Heno in Greek means one, one God, but it's not one God at all. What Christianity is, is that there is a father, the great, great God, but there are all sorts of intermediaries. In fact, Paul says this in 1 Timothy 2, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, that's the man, Jesus Christ. Some of you went to Yeshiva, you know this verse. I'm kidding. That's very, very Christian. The idea that God is so great, you are a sinner, you're lost. There's nothing you can do to satisfy the Father, so you need intermediaries. And you can have one intermediary for sure, and that's you know who, but the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, they add more in. So not only do we worship Jesus, but we also worship Mary. The Catholics are careful, they don't use the word worship. Worship, they venerate her, so it's venerate, it's not really worship her, they worship her. They pray to her, and all the saints, and all of these are mediators. And Isaiah says all of this is going to be destroyed at the end of the day. It's interesting, the last passage is that Davka, he places the moon first. The moon is going to be ashamed, and it's the sun that will be embarrassed. Why is that? It's very likely Isaiah had in view Christian teaching, a fundamental idea conveyed in the Christian Bible itself. Some of you were Christians. Remember the book of Revelation very, very well. Uh, there you go. I see all the heads nodding, so I know, okay, that was like a total giveaway. And all the guys who went to Yeshua are going, I don't know what he's talking about. What is that? Okay. So it's really probably the most famous, among the most famous passages in the book of Revelation. It's Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, where we are told about the woman who is generally viewed as Mary, she'll be clothed in the sun and the moon will be between her feet. There are some Christians that view the woman as the church, most view it as Mary. But so what is the head here in this epic vision in the Christian Bible that the moon is what's to be worshiped? That's the essence. Between Mary's seat because Mary birthed him. She is the Theotokos, the very mother of God. And Yeshayahu therefore reverses because the moon, people understood, was only a reflection of the sun. Right? The shayrish, the source of the light that we see in the moon, the, the moon isn't giving forth that light. This is not advanced. They always, they knew this in the ancient world, that the sun was, was illuminating the moon. But Isaiah Davka puts the moon first and says, this is going to be the arch enemy of the nation of Israel, of every teaching that, and at the end of days, this religious system where the moon is put at the head and the sun too will join in that humiliation and everyone will know the truth. And therefore it's really quite delicious how Isaiah 24 moves into 25. It's something that really can make you dance if you understand what's going on. Now, Isaiah 25 moves into, it's like, you know, God, it's like, you know, like the great movements of a symphony, where you move from the first moon to the second moon, you just lose your mind. Isaiah 25 begins with explosive shiro, praise. You really would think, if you're reading the opening passages of Isaiah 25, the imamish reading, to say for Tehillim, you're reading the book of Psalms. That's what it reads like. Navi does not read that way. This does. Isaiah is engaging in massive shira, which means songs about a Baruch Hu. Can anyone tell me why Isaiah, 
is a little sophisticated, would be looking at the Messianic age and making sure to sing Shira's song in praise and thanksgiving to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Why would Isaiah be want to make up for that? Brilliant. Excellent. So there we have the Gemara in Sanhedrin. Roy Hayechizkiah Melech Li Yois Melech HaMashiach Hezekiah, who I told you was worthy to be the Mashiach himself. He could have been the Mashiach. Now, is it just a history lesson? Like he was a really great man? I would say to you, Kindlech, my holy brothers and sisters, that when you hear statements like this, oracles like this, don't think you're reading history books when you're... It's the Gemara in Sanhedrin. It's Perichelech. It's the, the, Perichelech, the last chapter of Sanhedrin. Sadik Dalit, Omid Aleph. But understand that we're getting a picture of what Mashiach will be like. If you want to know what will Mashiach be like, he'll be a direct descendant of Chizkiyo, of Hezekiah. What, what kind of man will this be? Look at Chizkiyo. The Gemara says something very, it really is strange, and that is that why didn't Chizkiyo, why wasn't he Mashiach? I mean, Assyria could have been Gog, and that would have been it, right there. Why didn't Chizkiyo sing Shira that Isaiah is making up for here? So this is a very complicated issue. And there are many views on this. Really, Chazal, our sage of blessed memory, are really torn up over this. I, I think the, the, there are many answers to this question, but one of them I think is so transparent, it's impossible to ignore. And that is that, how long, we're living in such a time, how long ago was it that 300 Missiles and drones were shot at Eretz Israel. Just happened. Could you imagine? Persia is a thousand kilometers east of here. That's the closest that, to reach Persia. You have to go through Jordan and Iraq. More than 300 r- missiles. These are not Qassam rockets that are so. Mamash was shot at Eretz Israel. And this is a little weird. I hope you don't think I'm odd. So when the sirens went off, I watched it. Even though I can easily walk into a bomb shelter, my home, there's one room that's a bomb shelter. It's where I broadcast from, but I didn't. I mamish watched it. And I couldn't believe what I was even looking at. I was standing in the shtoimim, just shocked, as all of us were. Why I don't go into bomb shelters, I'm not brave or anything like that. I just feel like I'm observing something historical. I just don't. I'm not brave. If I thought it was going to, not that I would know, whatever. Maybe I, it's a thing that I just watch in shock and awe because what we are viewing, what is, we are, my great grandfather, who my, I'm named after, he didn't get to see this. I'm, we're mamish watching. Unbelievable things are happening. Like if you, my great grandfather, if someone told him that this is going on today, he'd say, You're crazy. And it's happening in front of our eyes. Did we rejoice the next day when we understood the magnitude of the attack on Eretz Israel? They were all shot out of the sky. Did we? I think we did. I think we went, Thank you, Hashem, right? I want to I want to walk with you through the music. If you join me for a little on this. Did we, this is very deep, this is tight, and it's very intimate, so stay with me on this. Did we sing with Shira on that miracle as we would have if there was no October 7th? Probably not. That means because of the pain, the trauma that all of us are going through, we're all in a state of complete trauma. All of us are. We can't even think. All we know is that we have, there's an existential threat to our existence, right? We're all in very clear that right now, this is a ace sarahi Yaakov. It's a time of great tribulation for Yaakov, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. We understand that. But we're all traumatized. We're all together on this one. I don't have to even ask you. So my sweet sisters and brothers, can we understand Cheskyo had just witnessed the destruction of not only the ten northern tribes, but he also the destruction of Yehuda, with the exception of Shalayim? Is it possible, possible then, when that miracle happens after 
Not only the north was destroyed in three years, but Lachish was destroyed. Only that he would go there and he would not adequately sing Shira at a moment like that, that perhaps we on the time when Iran shot more than 300 rockets, guided missiles and, and drones, against us probably. So you get a feel for it. The greatness was there, but it was great trauma. Really, it's, it's we, we, and then what I want to do with you, my holy brothers and sisters, uh, this is very real what we're reading through. This is not us looking at ancient literature written by a remarkable prophet with a mastery of, uh, who had, who mastered the Hebrew language like no one in history. And there's no parallel to Isaiah in terms of his writing style. I'm ignoring all the alliteration and poetry. There's nothing in Tanakh that resembles the power of language that Isaiah used. No one, no one even comes close to that. And what I want to hopefully ignite within the soul of all of us is that these prophecies were preserved because they're knit in the because they're relevant today as they were on the day they were preached 2,700 years ago. You would read these chapters and you would think, when did the Kuliyama, did I, is Isaiah reading the newspapers now? Does he, is he know, how does he know this? But yet this is what's going on. So that's why we have this tremendous amount of shira that Yeshayahu Hanovi is praising HaKadosh Baruch Hu throughout these. He's obviously compensating for Chizkiyot's shortcoming. Chizkiyot does. We're going to do this in two lectures from now. We're going to go through um, Isaiah 38, where Chizkiyot does sing Shir. God saves him from a terminal illness. We're going to find it there. But that was something that happened during his life. But you can understand how traumatized Chizkiyot was. He was so devoted to his that perhaps this is probably the best fundamental explanation of what Chizkiyot was going through and why that would limit his response during this day. In Isaiah 25, the prophet begins by not just any kind of shir, but davka the shir of saying, that you don't change. I trust in you, and I trust in no one else. You kept your word. You never changed anything. I, I was just in a kind of a debate that'll be up on YouTube, you know, with, with a Christian there and some Muslims there. And what I wanted to convey to the question is that nothing could chas v'chalila change. The church is founded on the idea that there is a change. In fact, the most incendiary book in the Christian Bible is called an epistle to Hebrews. Despite its nice name, it has the word Hebrews in it, you think, oh, this must be a friendly book. If the whole book, it's 13 chapters, is essentially a nuclear attack against Judaism. The whole thing is an argument against Judaism from beginning to end. Who wrote? We don't know. It's written anonymously. Early church fathers came to believe that Paul wrote it, even though it's impossible. I mean, this can't be because of the style, the language, and the way it's written. But it is certainly Pauline. But the purpose of the book of Hebrews is to say there's something new, and that's how the book of Hebrews begins. It begins that in the days of old, in yesteryear, how did God speak to us through the prophets? And now he's coming to us through his son. And it goes on that, there's the, that his, he's the priest, he's the Sabbath, he's greater than Moses, greater than the angels, greater than Joshua, he's greater, he's a high priest. Well, he said, don't ask. And it's all new, new. And I tell him, it's, there's nothing new about Tanakh. That's why it's hard for from Jews who are you know, doing dissertations at academic centers to write dissertations because Judaism really doesn't lend itself to new innovation. I mean, the fund of the Ikari Hamuna, the foundations of our faith, really, are not given to change. It's very interesting that in the chapters that will follow, we are told in Isaiah 27, verse 9, that the way that Jacob toned for his sins is by destroying idolatry. Another verse that you could probably guess would not make its way into the Christian Bible. Isaiah 27 begins with the destruction, and all of it is the destruction of the enemies of Klal Yisrael. We have in Tanakh that the great um, enemies of Klal Yisrael are essentially two. Now, who those are, one of them is Edom. We have whole books in Tanakh written that Edom is an implacable enemy of the Jewish people and has to be totally destroyed. Who that other one is, 
Persia is the most likely candidate there. In Isaiah 27, which it's, he's, these two enemies are called the Leviathan of the Nochash, the serpent, the great serpent of the sea, this marine creature. It's not the good Leviathan that will eat when Mashiach will, will, uh, that will serve as a meal, but this is a serpent of a giant marine animal that are in the oceans. And, you know, in the ancient world, why Isaiah would use such language is that in the ancient world, you really, it was almost impossible to travel over land. If you wanted to ship food from here to Turkey, or it would be more likely the other way around, to go in a caravan, you could have horses or donkeys or camels, pulling, but it's a very complicated, very, it's almost impossible to do. Things were shipped by water. And water is what connected nations. Whoever controlled Egypt really controlled the world empire. Egypt was a breadbasket, had a, a tremendous amount of water, they could feed all of from the West and Spain, Italy, Greece, everything. So the nations are all connected by these great waters. And this is what Isaiah has in view. But Hashem will protect his vineyard. You remember Isaiah chapter 5, the parable of the vineyard, where I, I took care of you, I guarded you, I protected you. But ultimately, what? even though I gave you the best land, I protected, what did you give me? You didn't give me grapes. You gave me these inferior fruit. But in the Messianic age, we're going to have that great fruit. The clouds will be protected and will produce the best of the best. And in fact, Isaiah chapter 27 ends with a passage you all know. It'll be on that day. Itoka b'shefer gadol. You know the rest of this passage. Uvo ha'ovdim be'eretz Asher, and those who have been lost to Assyria. Vahani dochim be'eretz Mitzrayim, and those who are displaced from Egypt. Vishtachu la'Hashem b'hara kodesh. They will bow before God on His holy mountain. Be Yerushalayim here in Yerushalayim. May we see the coming of the true Mashiach quickly in our time. We're very fortunate that we're living in an epic moment in history where we can see the prophets come alive, where we can not only hear the sounds of the instruments, but we can now hear the harmony of this great symphony that the greatest men and women, women the Nevi'im of Klai Yisrael, convey to us these holy oracles. Thank you for joining us tonight. If you enjoy this program, please like and subscribe. Adon Olach, Asher Malach, V'terem Kol, Yetzir Nivra, Let Nasa, Bechev Tzokol, Azai Melech, Azai Melech, Shemu Nikra. Thank you.